Welcome back into the show. Uh, we'll get the names right for you now. Stephen Kumar from Retail Oasis uh, joining us. As well as that, we've got uh, Ed Butler from Ibis World in Melbourne. And sitting alongside Stephen, Sean Hickman from MyClothesHorse.com. So I've been jumping around a little bit. But if I can go back to uh, you, Ed Butler, in Melbourne, first off. You were talking just before that break, in essence, about... Uh, you know, the, the attractiveness now, I just want to know what has been the trigger point. What has suddenly seen the clamour to come down under? Because there would always been this confusion about will the Northern Hemisphere fashions work if they sit them in warehouses and roll them out belatedly? Or, you know, how has all that been ironed out? There is a real seasonal challenge for the likes of Zara coming down to Australia. I mean, I, I heard your guest talking earlier about um, sort of to the two-week turnover from catwalk to, to retail to retail store. But the problem is that um, it's something on the catwalk in Paris in spring, um, it's autumn in Australia and it's moving into winter. So there's actually the possibility that it won't actually be a functional uh, wardrobe item for some time. So it is a pretty significant problem for, for that part of Zara's business model. Uh, what we're more likely to see is just like a, a focus on pricing and a focus on cash and focus on, on that kind of thing. Uh, the broader problem for the Australian market over the past sort of six months, maybe five years even, has been a pricing one. Um, we've seen, strangely enough, for what has traditionally been a very differentiated market, uh, a real uh, sort of price-based competition. Um, you tend to associate uh, price-based competition with very homogenised goods. I know milk's been in the, in, the, in the media a lot because milk's milk. It's very hard to dis distinguish one type of milk from another. Whereas when you've got uh, innumerable different designers and you've got uh, you know, an incredible number of different outlets and, and different designs and different clothing items, uh, it's strange that the, in Australia the, the competition has come back to price and, and it's, it's really quite bad for local retailers that the competition is now based on price when these foreign players are coming in with their huge scale uh, and their massive resources. Stephen Cormer, do you agree with that? Uh, I think the point that Ed's making is, is actually correct, but I actually think you've got to balance the equation. The consumer is always driven, first and foremost, by, by hearing or seeing something new, different or innovative. And the story that comes from Zara is firstly that, that there's access on a constant basis, every two weeks or twice a week redrops into store, of new exciting fashion. Now I accept Ed's point about the catwalks in Paris, but I mean let's be clear, I mean you know, women today don't kind of worry so much about that and there has been a constant shift to more sort of trans-seasonal fashions anyway. So, but every two weeks there's going to be new stories in this store. That's what will be exciting. And then the fact that it will just be so achievable from a pricing point of view, it's a really compelling argument. I would take that one step further, with, even with an internet store, if I don't have new stock every week or every two weeks, if I don't have a sale or two sales a week to get people to come back to the store, you get forgotten about, you go stale very, very quickly. And that's what's you, happening. People yeah. don't look at your store. There's, there's got to be a certain proportion, is there not, even if it's bricks and mortar or online, that is the old faithful. You can go and get your pinstripe suit, it will be in that corner, and that has to sort of be a reassuring offering. And it's like the white t-shirt of Zara. Well, it's like, you go into a Zara, you'll always find a white Zara t-shirt. I don't just dispense with them because they just suddenly decide white's not in fashion. That'll always... Uh, everyone, everyone yeah. makes a point of mm. endeavouring to always be in stock of what you call your core basics. Mm. And that's an important, a very, very important part of their story. Does that but become harder, incidentally, from where you sit, and also with, with the, the push that you're putting on with putting forward young designers who are all the time shaking up the market. How do you, how do you have a core? How do you tell consumers reassur in a reassuring way, uh, come back to us because we're going to deliver what you got last time? Just try um, to augment it. I think that's a little bit harder with an online store because we are, most stores in my business is taken to the end of line stock. Mm -hmm. It's very price competitive. You know, my average price is 70% off retail. Mm -hmm. So our price point is very, very important. So at that point in time, you're finding that, that a designer sells out of all white t-shirts for example and they either, they either go out and cut more mm -hmm. and then they end up with oversupply or they don't cut more mm -hmm. and that's what we said and if they, if they overcut then we can come in and redistribute those across Australia. I mean 70% of our sales are to regional areas so 70% of our sales go to areas where there are no stores 
Yeah. So it's a very different scenario, but we have to reinvent ourselves. That comes back to that same issue. We don't reinvent ourselves. And meanwhile, no you, meanwhile, you're getting a currency, and you work in the money markets. You know this all too well. That, I'm surprised your fingernails aren't burning to the quick, because you know, on a day-by-day -day basis, we're punching above our weight. Oh, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> you, you, you know, I work. think one thing people are very getting very, very wrong is at the moment all you're hearing talk about people talk about the Aussie dollar against the US at 90 cents or a dollar. People's analysts are coming through. I think uh, CBA came through last week talking about their estimate. They've brought it up. If you, but no one's talking 110, 120, 130, 140. Mm. They're not. Why not? Because that's, a, that's how much we've come up from 60 odd cents a few years ago. Mm. You know, America wants to devalue the currency. You don't fight the Fed. One thing you learn and you know in your business, you don't fight the Fed. So the Fed wants to devalue the currency. That is tough if you're competing with overseas. And that won't change. I think it can get a lot worse before it gets better. Uh, back to Ed in Melbourne as well. What is on that same thematic going to stop people as they already are doing? There's no stopping them, surely, is there? Jumping on jet planes and going to Saks Fifth Ave and getting a product that is arguably not to be found here. So they can walk down uh, wherever they want to walk. You know, Queen Street, Willara, call it what you will, or, or up in uh, wherever in Melbourne or Perth, and, and they'll be seen with something different. Yeah, international shopping, I mean, like, it's always been a threat when the dollar's been strong that people have been willing to travel overseas and, and, and do their shopping overseas. Um, the, the bigger threat is online for the next five years. I mean, all the long-term forecasts for the Australian dollar are very strong. Um, they keep upgrading the long-term forecast. At first of it was 95 cents, then 98. Now they're saying it could be $1. ten for the next few years. Uh, and that's, that's a huge, huge challenge for retailers, brick-and-mortar retailers in Australia, uh, because basically we're sort of reaching a tipping point, even if the dollar wasn't very strong where the Australian consumer is becoming very comfortable with buying products online. Um, it wasn't that long ago that basically the, the common wisdom, the conventional wisdom was that uh, people would never buy clothes online because it's such a tactile product, you need to be able to touch it and try it on. Um, and it's becoming increasingly apparent that that's not the case, that people, if they're given reasonably good measurements, uh, they're perfectly happy to buy products online that this in was, the past we assumed they wouldn't. This was the thing in a, in a way, uh, I can't put it to you gentlemen here, that you know we had a game Paul Zara this week saying there are going to be those even inside uh, the, the, the short term period now, they're going to fall by the wayside in retail. But he was saying, and he would have to obviously pump for DJs, that they are, to, to quote, a one stop shop for all aspects of clothing and gifts. So they'll see, th they'll, they'll ride this, this rough patch out. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. You don't agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. Well, the history of retail suggests that uh, a fair share of the deadens are department stores. You've only got to look, maybe not less so to Australia, but to the American retail scene and count the number of department stores in the last 20 odd years that have failed. So, you know, I, I, I'm not suggesting for one minute that the DJs will fail. It's, it's a good business, very well run. But, you know, the department store will come under as much pressure as any other retail offering. And they are now. You've only got to look at the Mars share price. It hasn't been close to oh. its issue price. Disaster for the ADS investors. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The point to take from that, I'm trying to get an analogy with what you're offering. When Paul Zara says it's a one-stop shop for all aspects of clothing and gifts, so you, you, know, you do everything under the one roof. You can't necessarily do that online. You've got think, to, well, you can, but we don't try to, but you can. I mean, Not one site. No, of course. Well, Amazon yeah. cover a lot of areas, but, you know, yeah. you, know, you know, we only, it was mentioned earlier, I'd like to touch on that. If people buy clothes off of our site, we only have a 5% return. We offer a full refund anyway. So you get 5%, if someone puts a, a clothing on, doesn't quite work. That's and fine. To bring it back. If they want to bring it back, that's fine. Which no, is just, always the issue, but it's only 5% 5, 5 of people are doing it. And what, exactly. Yeah. And what people are starting to understand is actually safer to shop online with a credit card than it is to sign a credit card in a store. You've actually got more protection. Mm. And that, you know, I think people like David Jones, I think their problem going forward is the fact that their cornerstone of their turnover is being the older shopper. Mm -hmm. The older shopper is obviously by definition going, uh, going away. The new shopper is a lot more flexible. I mean, it's cheaper to, now to fly to America yeah. and buy a, an upgrade watch and come back on the weekend than well, it is to buy in Australia. Let's go back to Ed in uh, Ben Butler in Melbourne from Ibis Ward. There's a term out there that's bandied around called differentiation. And, and, and unless you actually come to grips with that, can, can you define that for me? How businesses in this market differentiate themselves? 
Well, clothing traditionally has been highly differentiated. Uh, differentiation is simply uh, having products that are different from your competitors. Uh, and clothing, almost by definition, is that. Uh, when, uh, uh, both your guests have talked quite a bit about Australian designers, and one designer is quite distinct from another. And in the past, that's always been a very clear selling point. If you know, call it Dinigan versus Morrissey, um, they are very different types of clothing, and they tend to appeal to very different markets. Uh, and in, in the past, that's what a great deal of particularly high-end retail, clothing retail, has been based on. Uh, and increasingly that sort of started moving down to Q's and Sports Girls and, and that mid-range provider. Uh, what we're seeing now is that it's all on price. And Part of it is sort of the retailers bring it upon themselves. Uh, during the GFC, we saw such heavy discounting as retailers tried to maintain turnover. So how do you differentiate? If there's a race to the bottom for everyone, how do you then differentiate yourself? Because you're all clamouring for that lowest bit of the, of the lowest hanging fruit. Exactly, and that's the real problem, is that the differentiation is now almost entirely on price. Um, as we've heard, like Zara, like the, the turnover of clothes has become faster and faster, and Zara is only going to speed that up. So basically the differentiation in the clothing sort of has become a blur, uh, which makes it very hard for consumers to choose between different types of clothing. So what yeah, becomes... Stephen, yeah, on the point that you're making, you know, uh, what you're saying is the market today in, in retail apparel lacks differentiation. Ed, that's what you're basically saying, and therefore everyone's chasing price. Yeah. And do you think, uh, well I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that's because the, con the, the retail sh owners uh, feel that they've lost their, their if you like, their, their ability to engage with consumers mm -hmm. and they believe that the consumer today is driven functionally and therefore will be driven by price as a means to purchase. Well, but that's almost contrary to the whole rationale, the emotional rationale behind buying clothing. Because the reality is that most of the stuff we buy we don't need. Well, it's a want, it's not a need, but you know, there, there's no differentiation in the market anymore. Is that, is that there's a lot of yeah. copying that well, sure, but is part of that due to the vagaries of, of the markets? I say that because we've had this expectation with shareholders that profits will run exponentially quarter on quarter, and if they don't, heads roll and vision in the process is sidelined. Is that a fair comment? Well, I don't think that necessarily the pricing, the, you know, what you were talking about before, is actually massive discounting, no. is actually affect profits. It affects turnover. Over, the actual return on sales is actually getting weaker and weaker. Yes. I think what you're going to see going forward, I think you're going to see some of the designers say, right, we've got to now stop having such big sales, mm -hmm. and some of them won't survive, and the others will. Because by definition, their export business is going by the wayside, their cream is gone. But then you look at someone like Louis Vuitton, you don't see big sales signs outside their store. No, you do not. No, and so that's the quality stores that do bring something new to the market, that are doing something better at the top of end, I think will actually do okay. But I don't think you'll see that outside of Zara stores either. It might not be. Right. is a constant pricing strategy. Totally. Theirs is not, and that's the point that I was trying to make earlier, they're not going to treat Australia any different to any other market. They have a constant pricing strategy, which belongs within the mix of leading new fashion, exactly. great engaging stores, exciting, uh, and the excitement and cachet that lives we, around that brand. The production and distribution process is and one to envy globally. Second yeah. to none. Yeah, gentlemen, we have got to leave it there. I want to thank you all, and we'll start by thanking Ed uh, Butler from Ibis World there in Melbourne. Ed, thanks so much for coming on to the show. Steve Colmar in studio from Retail Oasis, and alongside him, of course, uh, Sean Hickman from uh, MyClothesHorse.com. That is the show Retail Dissected, but there is so much more, of course, and in two years, the landscape, I wanted to get their views, because what will it look like then? One suspects a whole lot different to today. We'll see you next week.